Thanks so much for joining us uh, for the HDS Alumni uh, Where Are They Now event. We are just going to wait one more minute to allow other participants to uh, join us. Thanks so much. All right, we're just going to get started. Thanks so much for joining us uh, for the HDS alumni. Where are they now? Uh, my name is Margaret Okada Shek. Uh, I'm an associate director of admissions here at Harvard Divinity School uh, Office of Admissions. Um, and I'm just going to give you a brief overview of HDS um, first before we start um, with our panelists. Um, so, Located in Cambridge, Massachusetts, Harvard Divinity School is one of Harvard's 12 uh, graduate and professional schools. HDS was founded in 1816 and is one of the most religiously pluralistic divinity schools in the world, representing over 30 faith traditions, including students who aren't affiliated with any faith tradition. HDS brings together scholars of religion in conversation with religious practitioners as, as learning partners and community members. Our degree programs lead to infinite pathways with alums in every field and industry who value ethical leadership, religious literacy, and service-oriented mission-driven work. And we're so thrilled to have alumni with us today to talk about what they do. To give you a snapshot of the community at HDS, here is some data from this incoming class of students. We have 90 MTS students, 44 MDiv, and one THM. Within the incoming class, 52% identify as female, 32% as male, and 16% as non-binary. The average age is 25, and the age range of students enrolled went from uh, 20 to 56 years of age. HDS students reported over 30 different relig uh, religious affiliations, and students of color comprise of 36% of the incoming class. And international students made up another 14%. In addition, we have 99 colleges and universities represented in the incoming class, which means we really have students coming from an incredibly diverse array of institutions and academic training. We offer four degree programs. The first is the Master of Divinity or MDiv, which prepares graduates for chaplaincy and ministry broadly conceived or a range of other careers that center around service and ethical leadership. The Master of Theological Studies program, or MTS, enables students to explore deeply and broadly the languages, literatures, thought, institutions, practices, normative claims, and structures of a variety of theological fields and religious traditions. The Master of Theology program, or THM, is for applicants who already hold an MDiv and is designed to allow students to explore a topic in great depth or delve into a new topic that impacts their ministry, whatever that may look like. And then finally, the Master of Religion and Public Life, or MRPL, is a re recently launched degree program. It's for applicants who are experienced professionals who wish to develop in-depth knowledge of the ways religion influences public life in their field. HDS has five affiliated programs and, uh, and centers, which you can see listed on the left-hand side, um, and includes the brand new program for the evolution of spirituality. This program is spearheaded by Dr. Dan McKinnon and supports the scholarly study of emerging spiritual movements, marginalized spiritualities, and the innovative edges of established religious traditions. Note that there are also hundreds of other programs and centers elsewhere at Harvard and HDS uh, that HDS students have access to for programming, funding, and other resources. On the bottom right, you'll see a photo of the wonderful faculty here at HDS held by Dean David N. Hempton in the blue in the front. Faculty are fairly accessible to HDS students and are on the whole quite happy to provide guidance and mentorship. 
There are over 230 HDS courses offered last year, and HDS students also have access to courses across the entire university, as well as throughout the Boston Theological Interreligious Consortium, or BTI, which is a, cons uh, which is a group of 10 theological institutions of higher education in the Boston area. The BTI offers easy cross-registration, as well as a range of other resources across institutions. For MDiv and MTS students, 50% of your coursework can be completed outside of HDS, so students can truly customize their HDS experience and to create a, their unique path through the program and get the preparation each student needs for their goals. And if none of the thousands of courses available to you fit the bill, you can also work directly with HDS faculty to do an independent study. It's safe to say that no two HD, uh, HDS students have the same transcript. The Office of Student Life supports over 35 student organizations every year, and it's easy to start your own if there's something that doesn't exist that you think should. Some examples of student organizations are Queer Rights, the HDS Prison Education Project, the HDS Garden Group, and the Third Chapter, a group for students over 50 years of old. These student organizations host over 60 student-led events each year, in addition to the 500 recurring events, which include weekly worship services hosted by faith-based student organizations. The photo here is from the third annual Black Religion, Spirituality, and Culture Conference hosted by Harambe, a group for students of African descent this past year, which brought together scholars and students from a wide range of institutions, as well as outside of academia. There are also two weekly events at HDS, noon service on Wednesdays and community tea on Tuesdays, and students have access to events and organizations across Harvard University. HDS offers very generous financial aid. 90% of students receive funding and this is available for the MTS and MDiv programs. We put the vast majority of our financial aid funding into need-based aid in order to get the most money to the people who need it. And therefore, we strongly encourage everyone to submit a financial aid application so you can be considered for need-based aid. 10% of, re uh, of our students receive merit awards, and those are based solely on the strength of your application. Our baseline need-based package is a 75% tuition grant. So as you're planning for graduate school and thinking about your budget, that's a good number to use. For folks with more need, we offer higher packages that cover 100% of tuition, and some come with a living stipend. Merit awards cover 100% of tuition and include a living stipend as well. So the application for admission is currently available now. So the deadline is January 7, 2021, and admissions decisions will be released in mid-March. If you're admitted, you'll find out your financial aid package within 24 hours of receiving your admissions decision. Um, and so as you'd see the, 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 we hope that everybody submits a financial aid application and that deadline will be in mid-February. We release decisions in mid-March and then um, the response deadline would be in mid-April. So here are a few ways to stay connected. We have a ton of virtual upcoming events, um, and I want to in particular note that we have a virtual open house coming up next Wednesday, October 28th. Please consider joining us as your schedule allows, and we'll have both synchronous and asynchronous content, which will be available after the event as well. And this is a really great opportunity for you to connect with current students, staff, faculty, and have lots of conversations about your interests. Our current students are also happy to be in touch with you. Email ask underscore students to be connected to them. We've got a great admissions blog and our Instagram is also a good way to stay in touch. And finally, don't hesitate to reach out with any questions. And now let's get to our main event. Thanks so much for joining us. Um, we're so thrilled um, to be joined today with by, um, oops, Sorry about that. We're so thrilled today to be joined with you by Anissa Connor, who's our Associate Director. Um, me. Sorry. 
Sorry about this. I'm having a little bit of a technical issue. And sorry about that too. I was on mute while I was talking. So um, Margaret, I said, um, I can just kick things off while you bring that PowerPoint presentation back up. So yes, thanks for having me, everyone. Uh, my name is Anissa Connor. I'm the Associate Director of Alumni Relations at Harvard Divinity School. And I was, I was really thrilled to partner with Sarah and Margaret in admissions to give you all an opportunity to hear from our alums who are here. Um, just as a piece of housekeeping before we um, move on to the questions that I've discussed or that have been discussed with Celine, Nick, Marcus, and Jen, um, we're going to go. I'll have our panelists introduce themselves um, and then uh, talk about a couple questions that we predetermined as a group. And then at 1240, we'll transition to Q&A. And if anyone that is joining us today has any questions that they think as we, as they hear something come up or something comes to mind, I wanna encourage you to enter those questions into the Q&A box. And I will then, once we get to that portion of this program, I'll have them there and um, and can pose them to our panelists. So with that, I would love for um, our panelists to each just briefly introduce themselves. Um, uh, so mention your name, degree, year, and, and what you're up to right now, and then we can pivot into questions. And why don't we go in the order that you're all listed on the PowerPoint? So let's start with Nick. Thanks, Anissa. So Nick Dials here. Um, I completed my master's in theological studies in 2012, so eight years ago, and I focused in uh, religion and literature. I um, had come from a background of studying comparative literature and then did the, the degree at the Divinity School. Um, now I'm not working in literature, but I still love it and appreciate it very much. Um, but I work in management consulting um, as uh, an executive search professional, focusing on CEO and board level um, recruitment. So, thanks. Jen? Yeah, hi everyone. Um, I'm Jen Hollis. I got my Master of Divinity in 2003. Um, I'm a writer and a music thanatologist. Um, music thanatologist means that I use harp and vocal music with patients and families who are at the end of life. Um, I've done that for about 20 years now. And uh, in the COVID-19 context, what I'm doing for that right now is developing um, with some other harpists and organization called Harps of Comfort to do um, music sessions remotely. So, uh, and we've started to work uh, with a hospital in uh, Wisconsin. Thank you, Celine. Hello, hello everyone. I'm Celine Ibrahim. I received my MDiv in 2011 and I focused in Islamic ministry studies and was the first person to go through HDS in Islamic ministry studies with an MDiv. And I'm currently teaching high school, teaching a world religions class, teaching ethics classes, philosophy classes. And prior to that, I was a chaplain at Tufts University for, for several years and ran nonprofit institutions promoting um, interfaith relations. Thank you, Marcus. All right, I'm uh, Reverend Marcus McCullough, uh, class of 2010, the best class ever from Harvard Divinity School. Uh, I received my Master of Divinity, and uh, currently I'm on my second congregation. I'm a pastor in the African Methodist Episcopal Church, and I'm serving as senior pastor of Bethel AME Church here in Springfield, Massachusetts, and um, also working as a hospital chaplain. So thank you for having me. Thank you, everyone. Um, so with that, I'm going to pose our first question with the, to the group, which is, why did you decide to attend to HDS? And for order's sake, why don't we start with Marcus since you were last, so. <laughs> All right. All right. Um, yeah, so when I, I came to Divinity School straight out of college, and I studied religion in undergrad, and I knew... Uh, there were two things I was really going for. One, a master of divinity to pursue ordination in my denomination, but I also wanted um, some really strong academic training uh, for going on to the next level of study. And so uh, HDS was just one of a few places 
is that I, I knew I would get the best of both of those endeavors. Um, on a practical note, some of the things that really, really attracted me to HDS specifically was the requirement to take languages. I thought that was really cool. Um, the very interfaith, interreligious environment, I thought that was important for me. And, um, and the requirement to take other religions. Those were a couple of things that just really, really drew me and attracted me. And uh, I think it worked out very well. We think so too, Marcus. <laughs> I'll, I'll jump in there and, and say very similarly to Marcus, I was attracted to that sense of rigorous academics and I, I did go on to do a PhD, but I also wanted that sense of community around differing spiritualities and, and you know, approaching to life's big questions. And so that, that environment that HDS provides certainly was at the time I was looking one of the richest and I think remains uh, the richest if I can say that. And um, I'm, I'm hopeful that as, as HDS continues to think about the questions of religion and public life, for instance, that, that the school is only going to become more and more relevant as, as we realize that so much of our world is in need of spiritual care of, of one form or another. Yeah, I would say that my um, path to HDS was a little bit different. Um, in another part of my life, I worked in admissions at HDS, and I loved to share this story as a bit of a cautionary tale about how not to apply to graduate school. Um, so I'll just share that I, I was living and working in uh, Montana, um, where I was doing my training in music and end of life care. And I had a full time job in a group home with teenagers. And when I finished my training, um, I wanted more education and preparation. Um, and because I'd been working in this group home, I had a lot of exposure to social work and that kind of service work. Um, and that, but that wasn't exactly what I wanted to do. I had a longing for what I now know was ministry, but I didn't have that word. I didn't quite know what that was. Um, and then I went to a wedding in Boston at the Paulus Center and I sat next to a couple that said they were going to Harvard Divinity School. And I said, Harvard Divinity School, what's that? And they told me all about Divinity School and the things that they were, were thinking about and talking about. And I had sort of this moment of, oh, that's the world that I've been looking for. And so um, this was a long time ago. So I wrote away for a, a paper brochure and a paper application. And once I kind of got a sense of what divinity could uh, be, a divinity school could be, and um, the kinds of questions and conversations I could engage in, it seemed like a perfect fit. So um, I applied very late in the, in the admissions season and um, gratefully I was, I was admitted. Great, it's a, a very similar story for me. Um, I was at the University of Georgia back in 2009-10. I was studying comparative literature and my mentor um, uh, at the time, I was writing a thesis with her and she had gone to Harvard Divinity School back in the 1970s and had these stories of having lived in, uh, you know, uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson's dorm room. And, you know, it was a different place back then, but really kind of uh, built some allure around what the experience would be and the quality of the academics. Um, so I think by getting in touch with some faculty and looking at the broader programming at, at the university and the access that you have as a divinity school student really what is what drew me in. And I, I visited you know, several peers as well and the community itself stood out. It was caring. Um, it's really diverse in terms of uh, racial diversity, sexual orientation, gender diversity, um, political thoughts, religious thought, and that, you know, it can maybe feel a little um, chaotic in a good way at times, that there's really diverse conversations, but I saw that when I visited and in the conversations I had, it, it, I just knew it was going to be a great experience. Um, and I'd never visited Boston before, and I think I fell in love with sort of Cambridge, Boston at, at the time too, and um, that's really what landed me there. Thanks, Nick. Thanks, everyone. Um, so our next question uh, that I want to pose to the group is, 
What do you value most from your HDS experience and how has your experience shaped your career trajectory after graduation? So how about we start with um, Celine on this one? Wonderful. I just recently re released my first monograph. Um, all right, I'll make a plug if you insist. Uh, <laughs> Women and Gender in, in the Quran. It's from Oxford University Press. And right on the um, writing the endorsement of this is one of the professors that got me interested in the topic of women and gender in the Quran. Uh, she just retired this year and went to emeritus status, uh, but that's Leila Ahmed. And so from that moment, I walked into her room, you know, knowing I wanted to study Islam to her, you know, planting the seed in my mind. It just, there's a, a direct pattern. So I'd say mentorship is, is just so incredible and mentorship in a way that just is not about only your time at HDS, but is about your trajectory, you know, in my case, six, six years later, to still have that wonderful relationship. And, and um, she's, uh, Dr. Ahmed is one of many who have kind of taken me under their wing and encouraged me and, and met with me and, you know, critiqued my thought and work. And so that, that part alone is just fabulous to have these brilliant minds. Thanks. How about um, Nick next? Sure. Uh, I love that you said mentoring, Celine, because that's I had a list that, I, that was top of my list. Um, really, the faculty. I, I really spent a lot of time with Professor uh, Myra Rivera, um, who was very new at the time, who's now full fa uh, full professor, um, and uh, got to work on a book project with her. Got to you know really spend time and, and dig deep into philosophical and theological thought. Um, and also, as I was thinking, as, as you see, I, I'm not an academic, um, as I was exploring different career paths when graduating from HDS, had the encouragement and support from faculty. And you know, it didn't matter what I was going on to do. Um, <clears throat> I also, I think, I really value the breadth of experience I got. I did several different types of inter internships from career services to working actually in the main library and just getting exposure to some different types of work, which um, really broadened my thinking about what I would wanna do afterwards. Um, I, and I also value the, the access I had to the rest of the university, um, different departments and uh, different research centers, just it's unbeatable. Um, and I still value that and stay in touch with people that I you know, connected to back then. Um, I also value that I was, you know, I moved from having grown up in the Atlanta area, very new to New England 10 years ago, but it's become home and I've put down roots and I will probably never leave. And it, that, that would never have happened if it wasn't for HDS. Um, and my partner and I really value that. Um, and I think for my career trajectory, did you combine the questions? Is that okay? <laughs> yeah. Um, I think, I, I don't think I could have estimated the value of being a strong writer and the kind of critique and the difficulty sometimes of you know getting red ink back on on the the, the essays and but that now in a business role is probably my strongest asset and people say that constantly to me um, being able to communicate in written form and verbal form um, and that that was absolutely I would attribute it to my time there How about Marcus? Next. Sure. Um, I think uh, relationship, which I think includes mentorship, obviously. Um, I, I, I smile as I say it because some of my best friends in the world to this day uh, are people I went to HDS with over over 10 years ago um, from all different kind of faith backgrounds and and everything and and we we had a ball at HDS I'm not going to tell y'all the stories but we had so much fun not just studying together and growing together but just socially and um, I mean those relationships are so wonderful um, and I also think one of the cool things about HDS is it's, it's almost like a, a brotherhood, a sisterhood, a, a family. You can meet someone from HDS who was there years before you, but just the fact that like, wait, you're HDS too? I'm HDS, you know? And there is, there, there's a couple of connections. Um, I think of uh, 
Uh, Miss Katrina Scott, one of the chaplains at, at uh, Mass General, well, she has retired now, um, just meeting her for the first time and saying, wow, we're HDS together in different years and different eras. And that in that relationship was so instant. So that's one of the things that's actually helped my career uh, trajectory, uh, certainly in terms of the chaplaincy side. And um, I think HDS uh, in terms of relationship and uh, really critical thinking, critical study, um, has helped me engage my pastoral ministry in different ways as well. It's helped me um, become a stronger writer, uh, which makes me a better preacher and, and gives me the uh, greater ability to engage. So tons of gifts, tons of gifts that have helped. Yeah, I would echo um, what everyone has said, particularly, you know, mentorship and relationships and community. Um, you know, just this week, as I was struggling through some of the questions I have about, you know, how, how might this group I'm working with provide music over Zoom for COVID patients, I thought, oh, I'm getting really stuck inside my head, who can I turn to? And I immediately thought of two HDS friends, and I emailed them both, and we had a Zoom call, and of course, they provided not just information and resources, but kind of thoughtful reflection back to me about what they were hearing from me and what the next steps would be. So, I mean, and these are people who like I met in the line to get my Harvard photo ID 20 years ago, right? They're still part of my daily thought process about how can I do what I wanna do in the world. Um, and uh, one thing I also wanna just say is, um, I really valued field education while I was here. I feel like the field ed program at HDFs offers something really robust and deep and special. Um, I had a chance to be a chaplain at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, and that really has helped to shape and inform um, certainly my work in music and end-of-life care. It added a, a sort of depth and dimension to that that it didn't have before. Um, it certainly informs my writing. Um, and yeah, as a writer, I feel like my time at HDS, um, certainly academically and getting feedback in classes, but also the opportunities that I had as a writer at HDS. Um, you know, I was invited to do real research and present my own research as a graduate student. You know, at the end of my time there, I was invited to contribute a chapter to an edited volume that one of my professors was editing. Um, after I was at HDS, that, you know, that same professor, that same mentor asked if I wanted to um, write a book proposal for a book series she was editing, and that then I had a, a chance to publish a book. So, I mean, I, I feel like that sense of mentorship over time um, and the relationships over time is incredibly strong at HDS. I feel it's really been such a big part of my life. Thanks, everyone. Um, so our last question for the group before we transition to Q&A, and, and like I said, keep putting those questions in the Q&A box, and we'll get to the ones we can when we get to that time. Um, what do you wish you knew before you attended HDS? So why don't we start with Jen on this one since you just finished? <laughs> sure. Yeah, I'm happy to talk about these things. Um, one... Um, uh, I'm sorry to be another middle-aged person that talks about time, but I wish I'd known how quickly three years was going to go by. Um, I thought three years felt like a really long time. You know, college is four years and that felt like a long time and three years felt like a long time. But I just feel like there is nothing faster than a school year. just with um, you know, me more and build and the resources to access. If I'd had a sense of how quickly it would go by, I think I could have been focused sooner. Um, you know, as, as a ton of sort of professional folks coming into HD and I, uh, if I had it to do again, I think I would want um, to have more of that, a sense of like, what are the skills I'm really going after? What are the relationships I really wanna build? What are the resources I wanna make sure that I access in order to do the things I wanna do afterwards? Um, HDS is just everywhere you look, every person you meet is a wonderful resource. So it, it's not like you were gonna miss it, but I wish I'd had just a little bit more of a focus and a goal going into it. Um, and the other thing, I'm sorry to talk about money, but I wish that I had let myself 
understand the cost a little bit better. Um, I wish that I had simply just run the numbers. What does it mean if I take out this amount in loans and this and this? Um, there's no, there was really no reason for me not to know this. It had nothing to do with HDS. HDS communicated very clearly. It was me. It was me sort of having some magical thinking about um, just the cost of graduate school. So I wish I had just made myself a pot of coffee, sat down and said, okay, I'm gonna take out this amount of loans. This is what the repayment is gonna look like. And it, just in order to understand how it would kind of impact um, and, and how you know student debt impacts all of our abilities to make decisions about going into ministry and scholarship and other creative endeavors. So um, uh, that it's just one thing that I wish I had been a little bit more um, thoughtful about going into it instead of being well, just a little surprised at the end. <laughs> Thanks, Jen. Uh, how about Nick next? Sure. Um, <clears throat> I would echo the, the time comment. Um, I think I had my head down in the library and hanging out with my friends, as Marcus said, I did have a wonderful social life and it was, those are deep lifelong friendships that I have. But I, I, I think there were opportunities that Harvard presented from, from lectures at the Kennedy School to other things going on around campus, it can be overwhelming. So in a way you can just stay in a little bubble. And I wish I had realized this is only two years, it's four semesters, get everything, be exhausted, like get everything you can out of it. Um, but I think that's, you know, um, I, I, uh, I look back and think, what else could I have done during that time? Um, but I, I, I love Jen's practical advice as well. To really, to, to know what the time cost is, to know, um, uh, just to be thoughtful through the process. It's, it's, it's an exciting thing to go to graduate school, but know, you know, what your goals are. Um, then I think it will help give focus no matter where you end up. Um, yeah, that's what I would say. I, um, it's, it's easy to say something like 10 years looking out that I, I wish I'd known I wouldn't go into an academic career, but I don't regret doing the degree in any way. It's helped me in so many ways. So, yeah. Thank you. How about um, Marcus next? Yeah, um, of course, I echo everything that was said. I think, um, you know, I wish I had um, been more of a skilled reader, um, maybe a speed, <laughs> speed reading course or something like that. Um, I studied religion in undergrad, so I, I knew this kind of reading was dense, but then when I got to HDS, it was on another level. And so um, I think uh, that would be something that I would have I would have loved to to have learned. And of course, time management and all that. But but I, I think as I'm sitting here thinking, it's like, oh, the reading was was overwhelming. It was good. Uh, but uh, that's something I wish I, I would have learned. <laughs> Yeah, so some of us maybe come into HDS and there's a pathway in front of us that makes sense. There's a path to ordination or there's some logical steps afterwards. And because I was coming and doing preparation as a woman in, in a field that was really male kind of focused in, in terms of who could be an imam, for instance, I couldn't necessarily track my outcomes when I was going into HDS. And on, on the one hand that, is a little bit of a source of anxiety, but on the other hand, I think if I could have just reassured myself that, you know, you're you're going to be able to be creative and you're going to be able to not just have one career in one field, but to try to span careers and span areas of impact. And there's um, maybe a, a tendency to, I, I don't know what I am, for instance, am I a theologian? Am I a high school teacher? Am I, you know, an author or an activist or, and, and, you know, and then in my better moments, maybe I'm all of those things together and kind of being able to tell myself at the outset that you're, you're not preparing for just one thing. You're preparing as a human being, you know, to be in the world and, you know, and you're, you're acquiring skills along the way. And um, just on that note, one of the kind of skills that I, that I think 
um, I would tell myself to even do more of is, is picking up different spiritual practices along the way. Um, there's so many sort of centering practices or you know, different practices of reading. And I've been able to delve into a lot of that since leaving, um, since leaving divinity school, but there's, um, I mean, even I'm thinking of uh, all different indigenous spiritualities that are represented in the student body. And, and I could have uh, spent more time just sitting with people, you know, learning from their deep sources of wisdom, in addition to, to the more academic learning. Thanks, Celine. Um, we are doing great on time. We're four minutes early for the Q&A part. So um, thanks um, to you all for answering my questions. So we uh, have a bunch of great questions from our audience that I think this is a good time to transition to. So, and I, I will say to the group, I'm just gonna pick around because there's probably more than we can get to right here. So I'll try and um, pick out ones that that feel like they might um, be helpful to people as possible. So the first one um, I wanted to ask the group, why study religion theology if you're not going to go into it for a career? And I will say um, to the panel, if you all wanna answer this question, great. Or if you all just like, if you know, one or two of you wanna speak to it, that's fine too. Um, that do, do what feels right. So thanks. like I might be the one on call for this question. Um, I, you know, I, I, I went to HDS thinking that I would do a PhD. I think a lot of students entering um, have academic aspirations. And through the process, through mentoring, through discernment on, on, my, on my own, I decided that, that which was not the career path I wanted um, and wanted to explore other options. So I ended up going into business, but uh, there's such a value, I believe, from the study of the liberal arts, from academic pursuit, and whether it's, if you want to quantify it and say, well, it's analytical thinking, it's, it's research capabilities, writing, those are things I use every day and that are valued. Um, and they're never, my resume is never questioned. People will often ask, please tell me about why you have a degree in theology. And it's, it's actually a conversation starter. Um, and it's gotten me my foot in the doors of for many opportunities. Um, so I could never have predicted that I, I wouldn't, you know, when I started, um, that I wouldn't have gone on to an academic career, but I so value the experience. Um, and I don't think I would have discerned it quite, discerned my future if I had not been in that space at HDS. So. So thanks, Nick. Um, I had there are a couple um, that I think go together for Celine. So I'll I'll try and do a mashup here. So um, I I did read them. I just okay. I <laughs> gave you that that trouble of rephrasing. Okay. I, well, um, it's it's the last two. So um, did you feel there was a conflict with the things you were learning at HDS? Uh, and then also your experience as an MDiv. So, so those last two questions right now, those were the- yeah, So I, I think <laughs> maybe coming to HDS as a Muslim, I had a particular experience of Islam and it was kind of influenced by who I had encountered, where I had lived. And then what HDS helped to do was to broaden my horizon to say, here's a global landscape of what Muslims do. And I think that's, maybe fair to say you can generalize that to other people's experiences as well, that we might come with, with one particular way into a, a tradition if we're bringing one to HDS. And then the, the power of the Divinity School education, I think, is to do, on the one hand, the critical historical work and kind of take a step back. And then on the other hand, to just dive fully in and find a community of practice. And those two, at times there's tension. Um, and I think part of what makes me more effective as in my previous job, for instance, working with young Muslims is to be able to find ways to live in that tension, maybe between some knowledge about the historical unfolding of Islam and then, you know, how a particular practice that, that's community specific nestles within that. And, and so it, it allows you to do both that global perspective and that 
um, embodied um, perspective. So, I mean, and it's, it can be difficult. And I, I think many people go through HDS and have deep moments of crisis of faith or belief, or, you know, people might even change their affiliations or become more or less, um, you know, quote unquote religious or, you know, and, and part of the, the power is being in a, a community that's going to support you in asking those, those questions, you know, support you in, in your own inquiry. Um, and then, I think, I, sorry, I, I now I lost the other question, but that might be, be okay for now. Uh, it was the, um, talk about your experience as being an MDiv. Um, yeah, so I think that's a, that's a very important distinction that the program makes in terms of, uh, one, having an extra year to be able to discern and learn, and for me, uh, two years felt very fast and I, I needed that middle year to just be in one place without getting used to coming into a place or preparing to leave it. And the, the field education dimension was so important for me because I was doing work that didn't necessarily have a, a path forward. I was creating it and so I had to have kind of some type of uh, experiential dimension and HDS was great to say, yeah, we, you know, this is a new path for us too. And, and they were very supportive, everyone in the ministry studies office by helping me find what was appropriate for where I was and where I thought I might want to be. So it was, it was um, all kind of entrepreneurial in a way, having to, to find field eds, you know, that were not field eds that existed for 20 years, but, but that um, the, the ministry studies department that, that works in, in, in fields, field education is really open to you know, expanding their own portfolio of people who are involved in, in supervision and, and the like. Thanks for that. Um, so this next one that I'm going to post to the group is something that I think everybody can speak to. Um, so what were some of your favorite courses that you took while at HDS? How about we start with Jen? Um, I took a course called Religion and Healing. That was um, Religion and Healing was a big focus of um, my time at HDS. And this was a co-taught course between the medical school and the divinity school. And I think the idea was that it would be half and half, but it was a seminar. And on the first day of the seminar, I think about 75% of the people who showed up, um, and the course was held at the medical school campus, but the majority, a huge majority of people who showed up was, were divinity school students. So uh, I think it ended up being a little bit heavier weighted, but it was just very interesting to read through um, coursework about, healing um, and have these two very different kind of um, orientations towards what healing might look like. Um, so that's a, that's a course that came to mind. Marcus? I'll, I'll jump in, I'll try. I was sitting here trying to rack my brain about the courses that I took, it was a while ago. Um, I, I have fond memories of the Jewish liturgical year with Professor Levinson. Um, I just learning um, the deep roots of, of that faith tradition and that culture and how it's expressed in a liturgical year and then going to Christian liturgical year with at that time, Matt Meyer Bolton. I mean, it was just wonderful. Um, and I come from a Methodist tradition. So we are very liturgical calendar oriented. And so um, it, it was just such a great deep exploration of my own faith. And, and for me, it, it, it went into a broader perspective of Jesus's connection with his Jewish faith, which is, was, and still is important to me. Um, and, uh, and there's only one professor Levinson. So it was, uh, I definitely remember, uh, that wonderful class. Thanks. Um, how about Nick Max? Sure. Um, I, I remember a seminar, so you know, it was a class, sorry about that, a class of under 10 people um, and really about deep discussion and textual analysis, but it was a class with Myra Rivera and I believe it was called Theopoetics. So it was about 
thinking about theology and uh, poetry or poetics or a way of thinking about literary art um, and sort of the intersection with uh, sort of contemporary theological thought. And um, it was challenging because it was interdisciplinary. Um, and I just was exposed to some sources that I'd never thought about. Um, probably read theology more deeply than I had in the past because I had kind of had more philosophical focus um, in that interdisciplinary nature of it, which a lot of work at HDS is, I just loved. And it really ended up kind of defining the way I started working. Um, so it's good. There were so many though, everything with Mark Jordan, who's still on faculty, as well as Myra. I, he's, he, Mark is an incredible teacher. I just remember his lectures. I don't I can't even remember what the class was about. I just remember him talking. <laughs> so, uh. Uh, I'm also having so many courses that I could possibly choose from, but um, Anne Browdy, who runs the Women's Studies and Religion program and, and who is a, an historian on American religion, I'm thinking of classes I took with her that taught me how to do more archival research and more of the historical research, and also helped me see that the moment that I was a part of was a moment where women were also kind of inventing uh, ways to, to be religious in community. And so it helped me, you know, as a contemporary person, look back and see myself in a particular legacy of, of women religious leaders you know, from, from different, different traditions, you know, di a different era, different um, historical context, but to see myself in relation to that history, um, that, that was powerful. And, and she also, um, she, she's very invested in uh, indigenous traditions and um, Native American languages and the revival of, of those languages. And so it showed me an example of, of someone who you know, comes out of a, a Jewish background, becomes a historian, and then is also an activist, you know, reviving these, these heritage these, that stand um, in, in a precarious place right now. So she provided me as well a model of an activist in her role as historian. Thank you. Um, so this next question is um, more specifically for the chaplains in the room. Room. Um, <laughs> please elaborate more specifically on how HGS prepared you for chaplaincy. I think that's Jen and I. Jen, do you, or do you, you're, it's not, do you want to take it? Um, sure. I, I'm not sure I would identify myself as a chaplain. Um, but I did do, you know, a summer of CPE at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute here in Boston. Um, and that has informed other types of work that I do. Um, uh, you know, I would say uh, it was the field education program and the ability to simply be present to people who are, um, you know, in my case, going through cancer treatment. Um, and it's that opportunity through supervision and in relationship with other divinity school students who are in that same um, program to explore questions. You know, I, I was a graduate student and um, I had the opportunity to visit with patients and talk about things that were on their minds. And, um, you know, because of my background in music and end of life care, I, I have this, um, you know, I, I had thought even at that point for many years about what does it mean to accompany people who are suffering? And I meant that kind of concretely with music, but this was a different kind of accompaniment. It was less structured. Um, and, you know, uh, through, there, there is no way to teach you exactly how to do it. You sort of make your way through one moment at a time. And it's informed by your classes at HDS, it's informed by your supervisor, it's informed by the people that you're in relationship with, it's informed by your own spiritual practices. Um, and these are all things that are kind of uh, part of the world of HDS. And so um, it, it is both sort of an individual process to become the sort of person that does chaplaincy and it's also a kind of collaborative community process. Um, yeah, that was that I would underscore uh, everything that was just said, in, including that role of 
self-development, you know, in the capacity. It's, it's not like you can cognitively learn a set of skills. You're working in your heart. You're working on your ability to be present with people. You know, you're working on whatever biases prevent you from being present with, with people. And chaplaincy has a lot of different contexts. So if you know from the beginning what type of chaplain you want to be, you could obviously do a lot of interdisciplinary work, not only around the spiritual care piece, but around understanding the, the context. So if, if it is healthcare, then you know, there's so many resources around the university to help understand that context. I ended up going into university chaplaincy. And for me, that I was doing university chaplaincy along with, with my PhD program. And it was this wonderful realization that I could hang out with all of these young people, you know, talk about spiritual life, about spiritual practice, about what's going on for them. And this was a job, you know, so it was, it was about finding something you know, for me that was just immensely fulfilling and also happened to support me through a, a graduate school experience. Uh, so, you know, chaplaincy can be many, many different things, but, but Jen, I think your, your comments were just so beautiful there about it, it, it being about finding your own way into, into the work and your own um, like a toolkit uh, for, for being present with people. And I'll just add to that too. Um, um, I recently am not working, but I've been working as a hospital chaplain here at in Springfield for the last two years while pastoring the church. So help us Lord. Um, I think HDS gave so many gifts, uh, the ability to critically think, um, but the ability to talk to people that are different than you um is really really important you know um there there are so many most of the visits are are really intercultural cross-cultural and then the 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 conversation is is given more intensity because of the situation of someone's health or something like that and you know being there even in COVID we saw that a lot so um being there for people understanding people's different perspectives and and, and having enough confidence to, to say, yeah, I'm different and we're different, but we're still going to be able to connect with each other. And I think that's a great gift that HDS gave that helps with chaplaincy. Thanks, everyone. Um, so the next question I think um, everybody could probably speak to. Uh, how did you practice self-care, spiritual renewal, and work-life balance as an HDS student? I, I can just share that I was a mother of a toddler at that time and just one, which it kept me busy enough. Uh, but I, I think that part of, I would go home at night and sort of color and give her a bath and do something very non like intellectually focused. And then I would go do more rigorous coursework. And so just having somebody who I was caring for and caring about her needs as well. And, you know, uh, her concerns about, you know, going to the swing and balancing that with my concerns about um, the, these bigger, bigger issues of justice or, 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 or you know, existential questions about my own spirituality, whatever it was. Um, but I also find that certain ways in which I learned to, to make a life balance around habits around sleeping and eating and uh, those carried well then into my professional life as well. So I, I don't think, there's a, there's a stereotype that, that grad school has to be a totally like frazzled out uh, experience. And it can definitely be busy, but it doesn't have to be frazzled necessarily. I think part of the art of doing it is to find, find out how to be carve out moments of you know, contemplation or real presence or um, just restfulness among the, the, the busyness of, of the, the world and the, and the work. I would probably add this to the first, one of the first questions you asked in this, so which is what, what, what I wish I had known. I wish I had formulated a plan around self-care actually. Um, I was a little frazzled and I think I was a couple, a couple of years later as well. But um, yeah, I think it's important to find balance. Uh, and I did find that through a really strong community um, uh, and people that understand what you're thinking about, what you're going through, you're able to express um, 
I don't know who you are. Um, and there's, there's plenty of that. I, I, there's a divinity school. It's there's so many different types of people, like Marcus was saying, um, a lot of different types of thinking. So you're, there's a home for everyone. Um, and yeah, I, I think formulating that plan going in is, is probably very wise. I'll just add, um, I think I, I'm with you, Nick. I wish, that's one thing I wish I had known. Uh, one thing I wish I had seen coming. Um, for me, my time at HDS actually gave me some of my best self-care and started some of my worst self-care patterns. Um, staying up late, you know, or, or eating, not eating well, or you know, the other things that um, some instances I still deal with now. Um, so I think any, any place you go, um, having the conversation earlier, the better, and putting in little, little bits and positive habits in your routine as early as possible, um, I think can, can really help with that. I guess the only small thing um, I would add um, is that, uh, and, and maybe I'm contradicting something I said earlier, but um, there's just so much opportunity at a place like HDS. It's very easy to feel like you should kind of go after everything and do everything and use your time wisely and like, okay, well, it's just one more lecture, but I should go to that. And I think part of taking care of yourself is just making sure that you don't get to the end of every semester feeling like you have to sort of lay on the floor for a few weeks. You know, you have to <laughs> kind of keep a little balance, keep your life going, recognize that like, you know, you have to make choices carefully. You wanna take advantage. Anyway, um, I, I just think there's a particular intensity to a place like Harvard Divinity School and the wider Harvard University to, um, to do everything you possibly can because your time there is so precious, but you can't um, exhaust yourself. Um, I think for me, the self-care piece was about just friendships and relationships and building community and um, moving back from Montana to go to school here was also moving back to um, closer to my family. So that was very good. I got, it was a little bit of a homecoming, which was very nice. I've been um, away for five years. So I got to see more of my family and that really, I think helped uh, give a layer of kind of familiar, familiarity and sanity, um, uh, which really helped. Thank you, everyone. So we are actually one minute away from being at time. So, um, I just wanted to come in and say thank you so much to our panelists. Um, this has been really informative and you all offer a perspective that only you can offer. So I, <laughs> so I appreciate your time and willingness to take questions. Um, so uh, to our perspective students, uh, on behalf of my admissions colleagues, I'd like to say thank you for joining. If you, uh, I want to encourage you to, um, if you want to continue to learn more about HDS and explore if this is the right place for you, um, check out the admissions website that um, my colleague Sarah, I think, is going to put. Yes, uh, there it is um, in the chat uh, to check out some more virtual events. The nice thing is you don't need to travel to these. So um, take advantage of this rare opportunity to see everything from your home. Um, and if you have any questions that weren't answered today, uh, please reach out to the admissions office um, at the admissions website that Sarah also put in our chat. But thank you everyone. Thank you to our panelists, our prospective students. Um, it, was, it was really uh, nice having you all here. So, and I hope this is helpful to everyone. So with that, um, I hope everyone has a great day.